kind of a different video today. Um, in this video, the title is called, We Can Answer That Question. Now, over the years, um, I've always just been in awe of reading the four gospel accounts and the hard questions that come to Jesus and he answers them with the greatest of ease. And then he asks questions to them and they can't answer them. But over the years I've come to realize um, that because of the Holy Spirit and his understanding that he gives us and being able to compare scripture with scripture that we can answer those questions. We can answer the questions that the Pharisees either couldn't or wouldn't. Um, just like when Jesus confronted them over the baptism of uh, John the Baptist, you know, and he said the baptism of John, was it of men or was it of heaven? And the Pharisees all got in a huddle and said, well, if we say from heaven, he's going to say, why didn't you believe him? And if we say from men, huh, well, you know, the people are going to get mad and stone us because they took John for a prophet. And, you know, so there they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. Now, they didn't have to be. <laughs> they could have just acknowledged Jesus Christ as the blessed eternal son of God. Uh, but they wouldn't. Now for us, these questions are easy. Just like if you'll read through the account of Job and the questions that, that God asks to Job, uh, we can answer those. Um, it's wondrous. But uh, Job, at the time, you know, he had to put his hand over his mouth and he couldn't even speak. Um, he was in such awe of the glorious presence of the Lord God Almighty. And in this video, what I want to look at is um, a very simple scripture where Jesus questions the Pharisees. And then we're going to follow up with the Apostle Paul and what he says later on in 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> now, if you will turn to Matthew chapter 22, and starting in verse 41, Jesus speaks to the Pharisees. And he says, it says here, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Now folks, we have the answer to that. And the Pharisees, the whole point boiled down to this. They did not want to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God uh, because by doing so, it would threaten their very existence sitting in the seat of Moses because obviously a greater one than Moses is there among them, the eternal blessed son of the father who showed forth his mighty works, raising the dead. He raised up Lazarus in front of many witnesses. I mean, as Paul would say, this thing was not done in a corner. It wasn't hidden away. It was done in front of so many people and the Pharisees and the scribes were angry and they said, let's kill Jesus and while we're at it, let's get rid of Lazarus. I mean, this thing is getting out of hand and so they wanted to put it down. And um, they so despised Jesus. And that's why Jesus told them, um, if you love the Father, you would love me also because I come forth from the Father. But of course they would have nothing to do with him and they showed their true colors. They showed what kind of people they were. And so, therefore, they couldn't answer this question. And I'm going to tell you, today, the same religious body in Israel today cannot answer that question. And it's very simple. They have never acknowledged Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And in doing so, there's a veil over their hearts. And Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to get into that in a moment. But 
because of this veil, it kept them from understanding this passage of scripture as with all the Old Testament scripture. And today, uh, the religious Jewish body over there, the Orthodox Jews, they're very confused. They actually think that perhaps there'll be two messiahs, one who is a warring messiah and another who, who, um, who brings in the peace. And, and they have so many different conflicting views and they don't understand. And if they would just believe the gospel and they would put their trust in Christ, then that veil would be removed. And that's what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So here, here's the question. Here is the question. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. Now the Christ is the son of David because he's the root and offspring of Jesse. Okay, the root and offspring. See that? That's what it says over here in, um, towards the very end of, of our Bible. Revelation chapter 22, look at verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Jesus is both the root and the offspring because from him, from being the creator, man came forth, man was created. And of course, you can trace the lineage quite clearly from Adam all the way down to David. But he is also the offspring of David. He is the son of David, that is true. But Jesus was trying to get them to acknowledge his eternal sonship. He wanted them to acknowledge that he wasn't just the offspring of David, but also the root, that from him, the eternal blessed son comes forth all life because he's the word of God and everything was spoken to exi into existence by him. In fact, Hebrews tells us that much. Let's see what Hebrews chapter one has to say. And, and these are some scriptures that I hadn't even written down, but they come to mind. And it says, um, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So God the Father through the Son, the Word of God, made the worlds, everything. Okay, The sun, the moon, the stars, um, all the animals, then us, Adam and Eve, and and from them came all of mankind. And therefore, Jesus is both the root and he's the offspring. But they only saw the offspring. They did not want to acknowledge the root, okay? And so Israel um, is that branch that would be cut off. And, Jerus and Jerusalem is what he wept over when he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And he wept over it, knowing what would happen just 38, 39 short years later, how it would be destroyed. And here we have the Pharisees only getting it half right. They say unto him, the son of David, he saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Of course, they have to acknowledge that it was God that that uh, that helped David to to subdue all of his enemies. But what they didn't want to acknowledge that Jesus was that Son that was sent forth from the Father. Now they understood the Trinity, and that's the terrible, terrible. Uh, false doctrine that is perpetrated by these evil folks who teach that Jesus Christ is not eternally the Son of God but that he became the Son and that's hogwash plain and simple okay in simple Ozark language that's absolute hogwash and Jesus the, is always been the Son of God in eternity past he, he was acknowledged as the Son in several different places in the Old Testament. Um, they knew about the Son of God, 
but they refused to accept him as the Son of God because he threatened their existence, he threatened their power and authority, and they loved their power and authority. They loved to say long prayers and be thought of as and highly regarded in the synagogues and to get the best places to eat. Oh, they loved all that pomp and circumstance. And they were just thick with it. But they only wanted a Messiah that was the son of David. That was it. And even today, they're looking just for a man. They're not looking for the Son of God. They're not looking for Jesus, the Messiah, to come back. And that's going to be the trap that some of them will fall into and believe the Antichrist. Whereas Moses and Elijah come and speak those things which have already been spoken. And they bear witness of the truth. They are indeed God's witness in the earth. So... How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool? If David then call him Lord, how is he a son? Well, I can answer that. That's simple. Because he is the Son of God, who became the Son of Man. He is the root and the offspring of Jesse. Okay? So, he is, he is the one who has always been. He is God eternal manifest in the flesh as it says in John chapter 1. He is the one who created all the worlds and yet he came as a man to suffer on the cross, to shed his blood for the sins of mankind, to be buried, to raise victoriously the third day, to be seen of over 500 people, many, many eyewitnesses to the account. But these folks did not want to acknowledge that. And his questioning silenced them. Because what could they say? If they did not want to believe him, there was nothing more to be done. There was nothing else that they could say. So, what does Paul say about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3? Turn with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and let's begin in verse 11. And you will see here in this passage why we can answer that question, but they either could not or would not. For if that which is done away was glorious, how much more that which remaineth is glorious, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. You see, Moses shone so brightly after spending 40 days on the mountain with, with the Lord, with the holy angels up there, and the brightness of the Lord shone upon his face and he came down off that mountain reflecting that brilliance of God. So much so that they couldn't even steadfastly look upon him, so he put a veil over his face and now we see here how Paul uses that as an illustration for the veil that is upon the hearts of the children of Israel, the physical seed of Israel. But their minds were blinded. How are they blinded? You see, rather than accept God's mercy and His grace and, and uh, fall upon His mercies, His tender mercies, which the Bible tells us so sweetly that His tender mercies endureth forever. And I can tell you, friend, no matter what you're going through, no matter what happens, His mercy as your child, as I mean as His child, His mercy will not ever fail you. He never fails you. His tender mercy never stops. It never fails you. It always continues. It is an everlasting fountain of life, His mercy. And we see here, though, that... Moses, on the other hand, we know that after a while, that brilliance faded, that glory faded. Moses didn't have to wear a veil for the rest of his life, but that illustration is there for this whole purpose. And, and God uses that and, and through the apostles uses these Old Testament illustrations to, to make a point about um, he takes a physical thing, a physical illustration to make a spiritual point. Okay, a spiritual instruction. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end 
of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, and even so it is now, Paul wrote this almost 2,000 years ago, it hasn't even changed yet, brothers and sisters, and it's going to it's gonna continue until sometime in the tribulation when, when all of those who will believe upon him um, will go into the millennial kingdom, and uh, the wicked will not. They will not go into the millennial kingdom. Um, they will be cast into hell. But their minds were blinded for until this day. And here's what I want to say about that. If they had fallen upon the tender mercies of God and said, we can't keep the law. Which one of us can live up to your 613 commandments? We fail miserably. We can't go into bondage and keep your law. Lord God, you are holy and perfect and just and, and above reproach. Who are we to come before you and to make this kind of covenant? We're not even worthy. There is no way we can look unto you and say, yes, we can keep that covenant. But that's exactly what they did. Because what did they tell Moses? All that you have told us, we will do. All that you have spoken to us, we will do it. They put themselves in bondage under the law, under this old covenant that they can never keep, that they can never live up to. Because the law cannot give you spiritual life. It can extend your physical life if you walk in obedience, and that's exactly what it's talking about here. Um, obeying the commandments of God will give you a longer time in the land that God gave to the children of Israel. Um, you know what, even today, I mean, if you are not a lawbreaker and you don't go out and, and do terrible things and spend your life in jail and perhaps um, not end up getting executed, um, you can live a longer, more prosperous life obeying the law. But that doesn't give you eternal life. There's only one thing that can do that, and that is putting your trust in Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross. Now you're sealed until the day of redemption. You have eternal life, which can't be taken away. But the children of Israel put themselves in bondage in this old covenant, and it's all to illustrate for us today. It is so wonderful how God has taken things and then shown us that which we should not be doing and putting ourselves in bondage. And by the way, Paul wrote to the Galatians and, and he wrote to these different churches and explained to them, don't go back under the law. Don't go back under bondage. There's no life there. Walk in the liberty that Christ has given you. And so they didn't do that. They went under the law. Okay, But even the Old Testament tells us, Habakkuk, I think chapter 2, says the just shall live by his faith. So that is always how a man uh, or a woman has, has ever been uh, saved before God, to be justified by his faith, to trust in him, apart from the deeds of the law. And these folks couldn't understand that. And all throughout Israel's existence, they've had a type of Pharisee to where um, they're trusting in their own self-righteousness. They think they're going to go to heaven simply because they're the children of Abraham. And of course, Paul deals with that in, uh, I think, Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, um, that not all of the children of Israel are the children of promise because they have to believe the gospel. And God is no respecter of persons. Sure, he loves the physical seed of Abraham. Why do you think he wept over Jerusalem? Why do you think he suffered so much to go to them first and saying to the Gentiles, I'm not come, but to the lost sheep of Israel. He had to go to them first. And he loved them and he wanted to, to save them. He wanted them to believe on him. He said, if you don't believe me, believe me for the very work's sake. But they would not hearken. And just like Paul t tells us here later in 2 Corinthians, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. See, once we have Christ, that veil is removed. And we understand why well, we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, sealed until the day of redemption. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We are saved to the uttermost. And the Holy Spirit guides us and teaches us 
Um, he guides us into all truth, as the Bible says. And you should have no need that any man should teach you. The Holy Spirit teaches us and we share with one another. It's called exhortation. And we grow together in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we cast aside the false teachers and the false doctrine that, that can cause confusion in the church body and call it out for what it is and stand up for that which is right. But here, the Old Testament saints, and including the Pharisees, their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil and taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And by the way, a covenant is a testament. A testament is a covenant. I have an older video about that from a while back that you can look up. But even unto this day, and even unto this day, not just 2,000 years ago or so when Paul wrote this, but even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Now, by being Moses, he's talking about uh, the first five books of the Bible, okay, the law, um, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, so when a person will turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Of course. God gives us understanding. He loves us. He wants us to know the truth. And a true child of God hungers after the truth, hungers after righteousness, thirsts for it, longs for it. And it gives them joy. And they rejoice together with other saints who rejoice together in the truth. And they walk in the truth and they love the truth because can two walk together except they be agreed? No. Um, what fellowship hath light with darkness? You know, we, it doesn't. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now we have freedom, we can see the truth. And we can answer these questions, just like Jesus asked the Pharisees, which they couldn't answer. We know, we know the answer. We could say, Lord, yes, you truly are the son of David, but you're also the creator. You're the eternal Son of God, worthy of all worship and praise and honor that should be bestowed upon you. And every single person on the face of the earth should fall before you and worship you because you are worthy of that. See, we know the answer today, but they wouldn't see it. There was a veil over their hearts because they wouldn't believe. And that's what they had to do. They had to believe. And all these works were done for them. All these works and efforts Jesus did, raising people from the dead, healing the sick, uh, opening the eyes of the blind, feeding uh, thousands of people at one sitting with just a few loaves of bread and a few fishes. He did all of that for them. And they followed him around because he is providing a meal. It was not because they really loved him, but they were hungry and he fed them. And Isaiah addresses this concern over in, um, let me find the scripture. I don't have it marked. Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. See, he's the root of Jesse. He's the offspring of David. He comes before Jesse, before David's father even, because he is the creator of all heaven and earth. And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And it goes on to speak of, of the Lord Jesus Christ in this uh, passage. But who hath believed our report? They wouldn't believe, you see. The Pharisees wouldn't believe. So we know the answer. We know that the, an the answer that they wouldn't give because while he is the son of David, he's the blessed eternal son of God. He came forth from the Father, proceeded forth from him, eternally begotten. He has no beginning and no end. He has always been. Now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, 
even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Friends, we're going to get a new body one of these days. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. Uh, this tired old body is wearing out. And I'm only 55 years old. I don't know how some folks make it way longer. But uh, I'm looking forward to a new body. And I know some that with ailments that uh, certainly think the same way I do. And we see what's in Holy Scripture and in the Gospel accounts where Jesus asked these questions and we know the answer. We know the answer because the Lord has revealed it. Because that veil is gone, but for them, the veil is still there. But one of these days, very soon I believe, Moses and Elijah are going to come. We'll be raptured. They will come. And they will teach the children of Israel. And they will be faced with the decision, the biggest decision ever. Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe the word of the Lord spoken by these prophets? Who, by the way, will do signs and wonders before them, just like in days of old. Um, or do you reject it? And many will believe. And, of course, that is where the 144,000 Jewish males are raised up and um, sealed and uh, preach the gospel, I think, beginning in Jerusalem and going to um, all the nations. And... I believe that, um, I think I've covered this already in, in, the, in the video. I did a video about this in my Prophecy Timeline series, uh, but you can look into that. I, I think that um, eventually during the tribulation that they're all killed and they're all in heaven together and they are martyred for the cause of Christ and for his gospel. And um, they have their own song to sing. So... That's really going to do it for this video. Just something to ponder. And uh, until next time, God bless you and take care.